there was a protest where several women visitors to the jail, some guy's girlfriend got stripped off and some guy's wife. We said there'll be repercussions. Guys put balaclavas on and they grabbed the screws, literally lifted them off the ground, took them to the big cell, used an electric shaver to shave their heads, stripped them naked, a bucket of piss that had been capped for a week, fermenting, thrown around them and humiliated. And the mom was shocked, big lump of a prison officer, but he was shocked, he's only human. But uh, Shocking behaviour. It was. You know, but it's do on to us, or as we do on to you, or do on to others as they do on to you, the old saying. Um, and bottom line was, you f us, we, we're going to f with you, you know. At the heart of the maze lies a paradox. Violence was the reason for its existence. But it was also in the maze that gunmen on both sides of the conflict began to consider politics rather than violence as a way of achieving their aims. Despite all that had happened in the prison, it was still a force for moderation because here were people who were living together. But more importantly, we were, began, we were beginning to explore political alternatives to the violence. We had seminars, you know, on the politics of it all. Know your enemy, you know. I'll tell you more about Michael Collins. And, you know, it was highbrow. Longcast became a university of learning because people who didn't have the opportunity on the outside certainly got the opportunity on the inside. It politicised me more. Years ago, I couldn't look at the likes of Adams or McGuinness on television. I now accept those people have political mandates. Throughout the early 90s, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness were pushing the IRA towards a political solution. The decisive moment came in August 1994. The IRA has said that it will end its campaign of violence in just two hours. From Political now. leaders have been poring over its wording. The Prime Minister says he's encouraged. Unionists remain suspicious. The IRA move put the spotlight on the loyalist prisoners. Their leadership outside wanted to join the ceasefire, but couldn't do so without their prisoner support. We actually had a secret ballot on the wings on whether you wanted to back a ceasefire. It was a secret ballot because they'd all looked at me for, well, not leadership, but we're, we're backing Stoner, whatever he thinks. Right or wrong, we'll back him. Eighty percent of the inmates backed a ceasefire. It was announced by the former loyalist leader in the maze, Gusty Spence. Offered to the loved ones of all innocent victims over the past 25 years, abject yeah. and true remorse. Their leaders outside may have spoken about remorse and peace, but inside the maze, the loyalists were less, not more peaceful. I started the bonfires. I built the biggest bonfire going in that jail, and it was still burning the next day. Stone and his fellow loyalists knew that with the peace process making slow progress, the authorities dare not confront them. Normal prison discipline had been sacrificed for the chance of peace. These prisoners decided to have bonfires. Oh, well, let them burn a couple of grounds with the f equipment, their bedding and furniture and all the rest of it, keep them quiet. The lunatics ran the asylum. In late 1997, these same men found themselves once more the focus of the stalling storm and peace talks. Among loyalist prisoners, confidence was low and suspicion high. Then, in the maze itself, loyalist leader Billy Wright was assassinated. Loyalist prisoners were on the brink of revolt. It was feared they would order a return to war. Once again, the maze was the focal point of a troubled peace process today, as Mo Molum arrived for a visit that had been variously described as mad or brave. In admission of their importance, the British Secretary of State came to reassure the Loyalists in person. It was imperative that she did see us. We told her the pressure we were under in the prison and the, and the pressure the volunteer in the street was outside, you know, to retaliate. It was straightforward, it was quite businesslike. Um, and I was determined that the, the way to make progress with them was to not treat them as prisoners. If I treated them as kind of less than human, which when you think about what they'd done was one's immediate feeling, but I buried that and said, okay, if we're going to get anywhere, we have to talk face to face, eye to eye, 
And I managed to shake hands, say hello, and talk. She was well tuned in the Ulster politics. Affable woman, but she could play hardball. And there were things said there, you know, but she was able to answer them, you know. They feared that the government wasn't serious, that the talks had stalled, that their, their leadership on the outside of the prison was being led by the nose to a um, united Ireland. And they just felt, what was the point of engaging in this? They were just being made to look fools. Language got a bit earthy at times, and uh, she got a bit earthy with it as well. The expletives thrown in, but I honestly think if Mo Mullen hadn't came to see us, that we would have just went then, well, nobody's word is for anything here, you know. It was that crucial. The peace process survived, but one price was the early release of the May's prisoners. Both Republicans and Loyalists saw this as central to any peace agreement. On July the 28th, 2000, most of the remaining prisoners were released. Supporters came to reclaim their heroes, while much of the rest of society looked on in horror. Well, it's a bitter pill to swallow. This is part and parcel of putting this society to rest here, putting the society at peace and developing for the future. It would have been difficult for somebody that lost a relative watching prisoners coming out. And I think you need to be conscious of that. No particular section had a monopoly on the suffering within the conflict. And I think that needs to get across. Once we have achieved that, we're on the road to healing the sickness in our society. But that might prove optimistic in a society that has suffered 30 years of violence. And what do you say to the people who say your release is too high a price to pay for peace? Um, I would say you could be right. Michael Stone was released around 10 to 11, having completed just over 12 years of his life sentence for six murders. It was said to me by a politician on release of all prisoners that it isn't just the IRA, the unionist community are frightened of. You know, he says, Michael, the middle class unionist community are terrified of you. And that sort of shocked me. Returning 340 convicted paramilitaries to a troubled society is a risk. Many have not renounced violence, and the mere presence of others may provoke further conflict. People have said to me, they ever whack you, Michael, we're going back to war. And uh, I can't say anything about that, you know, because I was involved in retaliatory violence. The peace in Northern Ireland is conditional at best. Ex-prisoners have already been involved in violence and intimidation. Loyalist leader Johnny Adair has been rearrested. The double-edged influence of the maze is far from over, both for the society that created it and the men who spent their lives within its walls. I don't regret being a volunteer, but uh, the futility, believe it or not, of it all, you know? There's another body in the street. What does it achieve? I have this sense of a huge lump of humanity having wasted their lives, who have wasted their time in prison, be they on one side of the bars, on the other side of the bars. Isn't that a waste? Isn't that a massive waste of humanity? Hasn't it all been a massive waste of humanity?